I'm um, Alyssa Granacki. I'm a postdoctoral associate at Duke in Early Modern Italian Studies. I am Laura Banella, and I am Maris Podoska Curie Fellow at the University of Oxford. And today we are talking about Purgatory 23. Um, we are on the sixth terrace with the gluttonous. So we've moved up through the seven deadly sins. And it is here that Dante encounters uh, souls doing penance for gluttony. Yeah, um, even though we will be talking about uh, Purgatory 23, it is important to point out the structural unity of of Canto 23 and of Canto 24. So it's one episode, the encounter with Forese Donati, uh, a friend of Dante from uh, the uh, Duecento Florence. That this encounter encapsulates the encounter with Bonagiunto Orbicciani and the definition of what is the Dolce di Nuovo, this with new style that will come in the next Canto, Purgatorio 24. So, in this encounter with Forese, Dante evokes his youth and memories of his life in Florence. And this uh, connection with Florence is both literary and um, we can say moral. Um, with, um, so we are seeing Dante before the exile, we are seeing Dante referencing his friendship with Forese and referencing his lyric poetry, because we have the tenzone, so-called tenzone with Forese Donati, that is an exchange in sonnets, it's six sonnets, three from Dante, three from, three from Forese. They are pretty mm, hard. <laughs> they insult them. They are, in, they are insulting. Uh, and scholars debate uh, how much they are insulting. Uh, nevertheless, we see that uh, Dante frames his experience, his, uh, this autobiographical experience, in connection to, to the Rime, so to his lyric poetry. So it's a personal, but also literary autobiography. And in, uh, uh, in this uh, Purgatorio Canto, um, there is, a sort of palinody of the uh, tenzone. I mean, I don't think, and other scholars don't think that the tenzone is as much as important to deserve a whole canto uh, to be redeemed. But um, it's true that Dante references to his past experience and uh, to something that happened after Forese, so after his poetic experience, so a change. Uh, a conversion that encompasses poetry, but also politics, philosophy, I mean, the whole of Dante's intellectual experience. And it's symbolized by, in this canto, by the Tenzone, and in Purgatorio 31, when Beatrice uh, will accuse Dante of having dedicated himself to unworthy things, symbolized by the Pargoletta, symbolized by another woman, and again, this other woman that symbolizes earthly desires in general, is a woman from the Rime, from Dante's Greek poetry. So again, we have the framing of uh, his autobiographical the autobiography that is both literary and historical, we can say. I think the um, tenzone are so fun to teach Laura because students are always a little bit shocked to read them after reading Dante's Commedia. They're a little bit different. Their style is different. Their content is, is definitely different. So it's interesting to think about the way this moment becomes, like you're saying, a, a redemption for Dante, a kind of recasting of that time in, in his youth. And especially the figure of Nella um, is important in this, right? What do you think of it? Um, I, I love the encounter with Nella because I think she's so central to the Tenzone as well. So in the Tenzone, uh, if you're not familiar with them, Laura, I know you are, but maybe some people here haven't, <laughs> haven't read them. Um, 
basically Dante lobbies an insult at Correze that his wife is is cold, that she's she's found infredata, right? She's cold because her bed is empty, because Correze is not doing his job um, as her husband. And he even says there's um, a defecto al nido, right? Um, that there's a, a defect in, in the nest. And we see this completely transformed in Predicatorio 23, where Forese talks about his wife in a really uh, loving and beautiful way. He calls her la nella mia, my nella. Um, he calls her la verovella mia, my, my little widow. Um, and he, he says that he loves her, che molto amai, who, who I love very much. So I think this is such a great um, redemption of Nella and redemption of this early, early poetry. And it lets us see a side of Dante that maybe makes him a little bit more human. Um, maybe we all have those friendships in our youth that were a bit more jocular or, or scandalous. And I, I feel a little bit like this is Dante in his old age um, writing a really beautiful homage to, to his friend Forese. Yeah, and it's also interesting to think that Dante probably was thinking of the public and, and of people who would have read both the Tensone and the Commedia, and that in Florence, of course, they would have recognized Frese as the same person, and they would have known Nella. And so it's interesting, again, the connection between the what is literature, but it's a kind of literature that is really tied to life experiences. Absolutely. Um, and also, I think we get a really interesting marker of purgatory in the figure of Nella, and that's the question of, of time. So Forese basically tells us that the reason he's so high up the mountain, the reason why he's already made it to gluttony, the sixth terrace, is that Nella has been, has been praying for him and that her prayers have moved him forward. And this this concentration on time is really critical to all of purgatory, right? This marking of the passage of time before reaching um, paradise. And even in the very, in the second terzina already of this, of this canto, we get um, the reminder from Virgil that uh, Dante needs to move, move along. He, he needs to make sure he spends his time there correctly. So it's really interesting the way that time is also weaved throughout um, Purgatory 23. And I think reflecting that um, that focus on time that happens throughout the, the Cantica. Yeah, it's, uh, Purgatory is uh, terrestrial as uh, for time. And also, um, I was interested in this representation of the bodies, uh, the bodies of the souls. Uh, of course, there are souls that don't have proper bodies, and this will be explained later how souls can suffer. Uh, but uh, the uh, the canto Purgatorio twenty three begins uh, with um, the uh, mention to um, the souls are singing a psalm, and a psalm is. Um, references to the mouth. And the mouth is the organ through which souls uh, sin. Because these are the gluttonous. That is also uh, the first part of the face. And the face has a great role in this canto because when Dante sees Forese, so Dante is recognized by Forese, but Dante does not recognize Forese. As he did not recognize Brunetto in the, in the Inferno. And when Dante recognizes Forese, uh, he struggles because he sees his face and he's so thin that you can see uh, the M and the O that, that compose the word homo. And the M is uh, in the traits so with the nose uh, and the orbits, so, so thin that the M really stands out. And Dante is um, really struggles with the idea of the body that are, that are tormented and uses the word torta. And torta is the same word that appears in the Inferno, in Inferno 20, where the body of the fortune tellers are twisted and the face looks behind and then the cries. Because there is this 
other words that where the body uh, has is extremely important, and it is extremely important not just because uh, we are in a Catholic universe and we will uh, resurrect with bodies. They will resurrect with their bodies uh, after the last day of judgment, but because the body is part of the creation. And so it's part of the of God's will of God's creation. And this twisting of the body is always hard on Dante. It makes me think too um, of the beautiful acrostic that he creates in Purgatory 12, spelling warm, right? Spelling man. Mm-hmm. So I think throughout Purgatory, as you're pointing out, we have this very um, deep reflection also on kind of the nature of man and and its connection to the body, as I think you're pointing out, both the body being distorted in these various ways, like the sunken eyes, the M of the face. Um, and definitely, I, I love it actually in the line because he says, chi nel viso degli uomini, so we have uomini, legge uomo. So we kind of almost got that double emphasis too on, mm-hmm. on the humanness of that, of that experience, on how, how our bodies are so deeply connected to our human nature. Yeah, and to this other world that is in our world. So it's really on the other part of hers, and we don't think about it maybe. Even though editions usually have these beautiful maps, but you know, basically Purgatory is Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Uh, the beautiful, the beautiful maps that show the map of Purgatory rising out of the out of the ground are yeah really helpful in orienting you, but I think also still disorienting to a contemporary reader just because we're not used to conceiving of it in in that way. I think also in Purgatory 23, we get um, some earthly ties to Florence. So, Laura, who do we get from Florence in in Purgatory 23? Well, we have Forese Donati, of course, a friend of Dante. We have Nella, Forese's wife, uh, whose name we didn't know from the Tenzone, but probably their fellow citizens will know. And then we have Corso Donati, Forese's brother. And one of the most important political people in Florence at that time. And also, uh, Dante mentions Beatrice, so calls Beatrice by her name. And I mean, one of the reasons, the basic reason, is probably because Forese knew her. And so he can just say her name, not describe her as the loved woman, but Beatrice, because Forese knew her from Florence before she died. And, but the um, connection, so Corso Donati and Forese Donati uh, and Picarda Donati uh, creates a connection between the three realms, right? Yeah, so we because find we Corso have... condemned, right, in the inferno. Mm-hmm. And then we have Forese who's hanging out in purgatory waiting to make it to paradise. And then we have Picarda, um, in in paradise. Yeah, so we have one family and three possible destinies uh, that are chosen. I mean, we, we could discuss this a lot, but they are <laughs> three brothers, three siblings, and they have very, very different uh, futures in the afterlife. This, um, this instance also makes me think um, about the invective against Florentine women that we get and thinking that, um, you know, we have other political invectives in the various county, um, but here we get this focus on, on these kind of um, lascivious uh, Florentine women and it's contrasted so much with the image of Pius Nella, and then of course, as we mentioned, um, we will meet Picarda in in Paradise. So I always find this, um, it can be really hard to explain because it's it's easy, I think, to read um, a little bit of sexism or misogyny in Dante here um, in this invective. And at the same time, I think there's a really beautiful way and I think we can see this within the family too, that each person 
regardless of gender, is responsible for, for their own destiny. Um, and I think Teodolinda Barolini has really beautifully pointed out that uh, women are moral and intellectual agents in, in the comedy, yes. that, that they too are responsible um, for, for their fates. So yeah. I, we have so much Florence in this, in this comedy. Yeah. And the women um, also, uh, was Christina also wrote a very nice essay about the fact that women also symbolize uh, Florence cap capitalism and what is going on in society. So as for in Dante, there is always so much more going on. So it's not just uh, a misogynistic uh, attack toward women, but it's, it's much more, much more uh, layered. But uh, in the image of the women, they have their mouth open again. So here again, there is this recurrent image of the mouth, of the body. It's a very ecastic image at the end. These women are screaming because they would be punished. And this image of women uh, that are punished is also at the beginning where there is the reference to Mary. So the story of Mary, Jewish mother who was forced into cannibalism because she was dying of hunger. She was starving and she uh, decided to eat her own child. And this idea, she's, her mouth is represented as the beak of a bird of prey. So again, this image of the mouth connects various instances and it might make us think also, it might take us back to, to Ugolino as well in um, the Inferno, at the end of the Inferno, that question of his cannibalism, does he eat his children? Of course, then connected to the kind of redemptive cannibalism of Christianity, right? To take yeah. part of the body, of the flesh, the wine, the blood. Um, so a lot of semi-redemptive <laughs> moments here. In yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but definitely if Mary is starving and it's her own child, can be interpreted, I think, as a hint that Ugolino has well uh, ate his own, his own children uh, for spice starvation. Also, the idea that she has a big of prey could be connected to the fact that um, Ugolino was in the Torre della Muda in Pisa, where the words the birds of prey of the Comune were kept for the Muda. But who knows? I doubt it's by accident. I feel that Dante rarely uh, yeah. makes such <laughs> by by accident. Um, and I think, you know, as you pointed out, this this canto does such a great job of tying the other world to the terrestrial world, to the world, the historical world that Dante's readers would have known and been familiar with, not only through um, the ge kind of these geographical references to Florence and what's happening in Florence, but also through these biographical figures who he knew and, and loved throughout his life. Yeah, 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 definitely. And this canto really epitomizes what is a characteristic of the whole Purgatorio, but here being a real friendship, we can see it really uh, better than other cantos of, of Purgatory. And this canto will carry us into uh, Purgatorio 24, where we meet Bona Junta um, and we learn a little bit more about Dante's literary history and Another great encounter with, um, well, another great mention of women uh, with donne che avete intellato d'amore. So I think yes. that we get a great kind of intersecting number of themes here in, in Purgatorio 23. Yeah, they really are uh, one episode divided into cantos, yeah. They, they really are a unity, not, and not just because uh, Forese is always there, it's still there. It's this idea of connecting this biographical reality, even though uh, Bonagiunta is not part of that, uh, but the Vita Nuova and Tonne Cavetti Intelletto d'Amore are. Uh, so it continues, yeah, in the next canto. 
Uh, any final thoughts on Purgatorio 23, Laura? Well, this is definitely one of my favorite cantos. So I'm very happy to have had the possibility to discuss it with you and with whoever is going to watch this. All of you. Yes, I I love this. I love the encounter with Porese. And I think it's a great one to teach, especially with the uh, tensone. So I hope that this inspires someone to, to check out the tensone as well and some of Dante's early rime, those youthful those youthful rhymes. Yeah, more or less uh, funny <laughs> or philosophical, but the whole connected to what will happen later in the Commedia. Great, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Alyssa.